Stefan Stoll. Stefan is a workshop veteran. He has given many talks on EPR spectroscopy, led many of the uh, Pulse EPR practicals, and he's doing something new today. He's going to give a survey of EPR spectra uh, that many of you uh, have seen, will see perhaps at some point, and this will help you uh, find your way through the spectra that you collect. Stefan. So, um, I'm from Seattle, and uh, my lab does EPR spectroscopy. We specialize in pulse EPR, uh, but today I'm going to tell you about uh, CW EPR spectra. How many of you have physically and personally, unassisted, acquired a CW EPR spectrum? Raise your hand. And now, who has not? That is the majority. <laughs> okay, so today I want to give you a little overview of bio, what you could possibly encounter in bioorganic uh, chemistry with CW EPR spectra. So the goals here are to improve the understanding of CW EPR. And what, in my personal experience, the most difficult things are for novices to understand that you look at the derivative of an absorption spectrum. And the second is to understand what these powder spectra mean with the X, Y, and Z directions and all those, those axes that people are talking about. So these are the learning goals here. The contents is, first I will give you a little overview then we'll just walk through the periodic table and uh, briefly emphasize the characteristics of each spectrum. Don't get confused by all these wiggly, little squiggly lines on the screens. Try to see the pic picture, what we can learn. And that's what I'm going to summarize at the very end. I will tell you, and you will have seen what you can learn using CWEPR. And here comes a big disclaimer to all the EPR people, and to those who have done EPR here. I'm not going to give you a comprehensive survey of EPR. Your system might be missing here, right? Your favorite system might be missing here. The system of your competitor might be missing. So <laughs> I'm just picking examples I think are ins instructive. They might be important, chemically speaking, or maybe less so. All right, here's the EPR survival toolkit. If you want to do EPR spectroscopy, get those four books. Okay, and they're, they're in, in, in sort of increasing level of EPR sophistication. This is a very general description, especially the first half of the book. And here you open page one and you have a spin Hamiltonian. <laughs> okay? So if you're not ready to deal with the last book, you can download software and analyze your data. And EasySpin is a fairly commonly used EPR spectral simulation software that MATLAB develops. So go to easyspin.org and download it. Okay, well, uh, for those of you who have measured spectra, who know what a typical EPR spectrum looks like, and for those who don't, I will show you. Regular derivative band shape. No, this is a typical EPR spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> Where is the signal? <laughs> well, what you will see, there is noise everywhere. Well, there is some background signal, because from the previous person who measured and, and uh, broke the sample in the, in the resonator. <laughs> There is a dioxygen artifact because you f forget to degas your sample, or maybe oxygen is condensing onto your sample. You're measuring at 10 Kelvin. There is some sloping baseline. You have no clue why. <laughs> right? Okay, so that is the typical situation. So if I would do a survey of EPR spectra that are recorded, 90% would be like this. Of course, what people publish are the best ones they get. Like the one sample they managed to get a good signal from comes into the paper. Okay, and that's what I'm going to show you. Here is a periodic table, and it's focused on bioinorganic EPR. In dark gray and color, you see all the elements are relevant to life. Um, EPR active species are based on like two clusters of elements. One is the first row, mostly the late first row transition elements, and then there are organic radicals, which contain mostly carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. And all of these elements will give very, very different EPR spectra if they are in a paramagnetic center, if an unpaired electron is very close. So what we're going to do, we're going to walk through these elements. And there are really different characters of a, of a, of a cast or of a play. Think about Ocean's 11, uh, Ocean's 12, right? Mm -hmm. They're all very, very different, as you will see. But we'll try to emphasize the commonalities. And the difference starts right away. It's not just a difference between the different elements. It's a difference between the oxidation states. So here, on the horizontal, you see the electron configuration of transition metal ions. You start, let's start here. This is a 3D 10 ion. This has 10 electrons in the 5D orbitals. They're all paired up. Uh -huh. And you get a copper one, a copper one system is a typical example. 
That is diamond. It's non-magnetic. has no total spin. We can't see it in EPR. Right? If you put one electron out of those d orbitals, you get to a V9 system, and you get nickel-1 or copper-2. And those, you have one unpaired electron, or some people say you have a hole in the 10 unpaired electrons, in the 10 electrons. And those two give really nice, simple EPR spectra. We're going to talk about those first. Okay, then if you pull more electrons out, if you oxidize nickel-1, uh, you get to nickel-2. That's a little challenging. That's a spin-1. That's hard to observe with standard EPR. You have to go to some special facilities where you can do high-field high EPR. And th this trend continues. There's cobalt-2, manganese-2, iron-3, manganese-4, vanadium-4, which are green, which means they're half integer spins, as Carson said. And they're easy to observe in your lab. Uh, once you get past all the signal-to-noise issues and the fact that your spectrometer, spectrometer crashes right at the point where you want to save the data. <laughs> okay, and then the, the ones in tan color are integer spin systems. Those are difficult to observe but they can be observed. Every integer spin system can be observed, and that's where Carson is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do it in a, uh, in a standard X-band CWPR spectrometer, but you have to go to high field. The only thing you really can't observe is spin zero. Okay? So green is half integer spin, tan is integer spin, and all the others are. We're not going to talk about the gray one. All right. Now, um, the first important thing is to understand how does the EPR sample look like. Typically, we run at low temperatures, and we have frozen aqueous solutions of a protein. Now, here is a, a cartoon of a sample. Uh, imagine this is your EPR tube. So your protein molecules are immobilized in there. They just don't move, they don't move around, and don't, they don't rotate anymore. So we'll have a random, uniform distribution of static orientations of protein molecules. And the jargon, EPR jargon of this is a powder. It's not really a powder, right? It's a frozen solution, but we call it a powder. And the spectrum that comes from these types of samples we call powder spectra, as opposed to single crystals. Who has grown uh, protein single crystals? Raise your hands. Two people out of three. <laughs> there you go. Um, three people out of a hundred and something, okay? Powder spectra are way more important than single crystal spectra. <laughs> So it's important to understand them. Okay, so how do we mathematically describe this? We have, uh, we put the sample in a magnetic field. So there's a static magnetic field. Here we just draw it vertically. And then we illuminate the sample with microwave. And the, elect the magnetic field component of the microwave is perpendicular to that static field. This is fixed in the lab, relative to the lab, right? We, we call these directions the X, Y, Z directions in the lab. And so the lab fixed frame. Now, each protein, each protein, we can also define a local molecule fixed frame and give it also axis, uh, x, y, and z uh, axes. And if, if you rotate the protein, those x, y, z coordinates rotate with it. And whenever you see people talking about along x, along y, along z, those x, y, z's refer to specific directions in the protein. And typically the z axis is along the symmetry axis of, the, of your site of interest, of your local symmetry. All right, so let's start. We have a powder sample of a nickel-1 system. And you run your C CWPR spectrum. Uh, this is fake. This is simulated. <laughs> so there is no noise. <clears throat> and you'll see it looks like this. It has three peaks, right? And we also say three peaks. But actually, it doesn't have three peaks. There's only one. This is the derivative. And now if you integrate it, then you get the actual absorption spectrum that's underlying it. The derivative is just a trace of the slope of the absorption spectrum. So here, for example, there is no absorption at this field. But then it goes up. So the slope is positive. As a consequence, you get a positive feature in your CW EPR spectrum. Then the slope goes flat, even though there's a ton of absorption happening. But if there's a flat slope, it's a zero slope, and your EPR spectrum will show zero. So you think there is no signal here. Well, but there is. There's a ton of spins absorbing, OK? Now, if you come from the high field end, there is no absorption here. And then there is a certain a set of uh, proteins that absorb, start absorbing as you move lower. And you get a strong negative slope. If you plot that slope, the peak goes negative in your EPR spectrum. And in between, there's a spectral maximum. See that here? The slope there is flat. Zero, right? And that will correspond to this point here. That's where actually the absorption maximum is. On the CWPR spectrum, it's zero. OK? So whenever you see a CWPR spectrum, mentally integrate it to see the absorption spectrum. Then you can figure out what's going on. Now, why is this spectrum so wide? Why is it not like uh, those peaks we've seen in, in Karas 
uh, um, NMR spectra. Why is it so wide? Kara was showing you liquid state, uh, liquid state samples that were not frozen. Right? So there is tumbling that averages everything out that might be orientation dependent. CWPR, the sample is frozen. We see, we see orientation dependent effects. Now, uh, this particular nickel system is such that if you have uh, the, the protein Z axis aligned with the field, the absorption is at low magnetic field. But if you rotate the protein and you align the Y axis of the protein, so this is like the internal protein fixed, uh, uh, protein, one of the protein fixed axis with the magnetic field P0, the absorption moves to a higher field. And this would be if you align this X axis of the protein with the external fields. So these X, Y, Zs you will see a lot just correspond to which axis of the protein or your paramagnetic center are you aligning with the magnetic field. Now, as you go from the, as you rotate the protein from alignment this here to down here, you have a lot of intermediate orientations. And those intermediate orientations we're going to absorb at intermediate fields. In a powder sample, you have all of them together at the same time. So you will have, you will have a broad coverage of absorption that goes from the minimum that corresponds to like some specific orientation to a maximum that corresponds to another. And that's called a powder spectrum. The nature of it, it's really broad. Which, uh, the, the X going down. Uh, well, one to the left. This here? Uh, this. That's not, well, I'm looking at the axis, axes were flipped, so the two could be flipped. Is that, would that be correct or not? I don't know. The axis, the horizontal axis, is the same for both here, right? And the top really just shows, is the plot of the derivative, the slope of the bottom. There, that doesn't affect it. Okay. So 180 degree turn doesn't do much, doesn't do anything. All right, so this is a nickel one system. Nickel is a D9 system, so it's spin one half, one unpaired electron. So in each molecule there is one unpaired electron, but depending on the orientation of the protein, it absorbs at different places. And that's where you get a, a powder spectrum. Nickel has also a 1% abundant magnetic nucleus, nickel 61. If you have money, you can buy more nickel 61 and prepare a sample and then observe hyperfine splittings. But it's only 1% natural abundant, so you usually don't see anything. If you oxidize nickel and you go to nickel 2, then you have, you pull one electron out and you get a D8. And that will have a, um, typically it's high spin, spin 1, and then you won't see it in your in-lab EPR spectrometer. Okay, let's look at some examples. Actually, the G values I took from this paper on acetylcoenzyme A coenzyme A synthase. You can see it's a fairly complicated active site, but the EPR spectrum that's shown here, this is this state, it's called the A-reduced star state, comes from this nickel site here at the center. It's called the proximal nickel. And if it's in the oxi oxidation state one, it, it kind of behaves as if it were isolated. And then that's how the spectrum looks like. You can see di three distinct features. The positive slope feature, the negative slope feature, and then the feature that indicates the absorption maximum. Again, mentally, please integrate the spectrum all the time. And you can see, you can simulate it fairly well. What does this tell us, actually, to see the spectrum? Well, it tells us, OK, we have an unpaired electron, right? And if you know you have a nickel enzyme, then yes, it's nickel 1. You've identified the oxidation state. Then from these values, from the size of the values, you can also figure out what uh, type of coordination geometry, coordination geometry it is. OK, and you see here that there's one value that's pretty large and two values are pretty close to each other. That means there's like one axis that has a special symmetry relative to the two others. So you can identify the element, you can identify the oxidation state, and you can identify the coordination environment. Now here's a little model compound that actually comes extremely close to this, uh, this, this naturally occurring active site. It's nickel-substituted azurine. Azurine is kind of the toy molecule of the bioinorganic chemistry uh, community. Um, this is a trigonal planar coordination geometry with the hole in the x square minus y square. And it has essentially the exact same uh, g values. It is it's very symmetric. You see, we don't see the negative feature and the max feature. They're merged. Okay, and the reason is that in that plane where we have two histidines and sulfurs, there's just no, you can put your axis wherever you want, the x and the y. The z axis is going to be perpendicular to that plane. 
So you can, from these values, from the G values, you can learn about the coordination geometry. All right, here's some more nickel one examples. Here is one that's very recently published, Nikolai, congrats. Um, this is methyl coenzyme M reductase that also has a, has a nickel cofactor. And um, there is one state, that's actually the resting state of the reduced enzyme, it's a nickel one uh, hydrocorfinate that has a methionine coordinated from the top. If you look at the G values, there's one that stands out and two that's fairly close, still indicating some sort of symmetry here around the nickel site and a, a unique axis. Again, so we were able to identify the coordination geometry. Now let's move to nickel superoxide dismutase. It's another enzyme, and you know, it's a crystal structure. You can see it looks very different already. It's five coordinate, and if you take an EPR spectrum, lo and behold, it's flipped around. So the unique value that used to be here, and there were two values next to each other here, it's now the other way. The, the one G value that's furthest away is at high field, and the other two are much closer. So what happened? The hole, the unpaired electron, moved to a different orbital. Right? It moved to a dz squared orbital from the dxy squared, which where it's here and in the previous slide, it moved to a dc squared. And the dc squared goes along that nitrogen axis here, a nickel nitrogen axis. So the electron density is pointing towards the histidine, and we're actually picking up some hyperfine splitting from the nitrogen and the histidine. So this tells us we have a DC squared center nickel one with a histidine or some nitrogen ligand coordinated. Maybe it's a amide uh, backbone nitrogen. We would have to do some isotope labeling to do a kind of uh, as a control experiment. So you see, you can also learn about ligands directly from the spectra. Okay, so that's nickel. It's very simple, right? You have three G values. It's one unpaired electron. Now let's move to copper. Let's go copper two plus. It's isoelectronic to nickel one. It's a spin one half. If you have a copper one, if you reduce, you reduce it, you go to get spin zero. It's EPR silent. So EPR is mostly done on copper two. Um, now, the new thing about copper is essentially all copper nuclei on this planet are magnetic. They fall into two groups. There's a nickel 63, 69% abundant, and a copper 65, which is 31% abundant. The good thing about it is they're kind of more or less the same strength they have more or less the same strength of the magnetic moment. So for most purposes, you can consider them equivalent. All right, now this adds a whole new level of complexity to an EPR spectrum. Because now, this copper is a, a spin three halves, which means it can assume four different spin states. Okay, and at typical temperatures, uh, look here, these, these spin states are indicated by M sub I. M is the projection quantum number of the spin, and I means the nuclear spin. It can assume plus three half, plus one half, minus one half, minus three halves. But the important thing is, it's 25% each. So that if you pick a protein in your sample, there's like 25% 20, 20, 20, likelihood of finding the copper nucleus in like the M sub I three half state. Which means basically your, your sample breaks down into four subpopulations, right? With yeah, the copper in different states. So actually a total EPR spectrum, we're gonna look at the absorption first, it's gonna be a sum of those four. The blue, the red, the orange, and the purple. And if you look at each of these shapes, they look fairly similar to what we had before. They're like two characteristic limits. It's actually very simple, it's called an axial spectrum. The two characteristic limits, but they change depending on the state of the copper. And that is due to hyperfine coupling, the interaction between the unpaired electron and the copper. Now if you add them all up, you get this absorption spectrum that extends from here at the bottom all the way up to here. Now, if you take the derivative, that's what you actually measure. That's what you, what you get to see on your screen. You will see whenever there's a slope up, you will get a little peak here, a slope up indicator here, here four. You see it four times. So one, two, three, four, just follow straight up. And these four bumps here that indicate slope up regions in your absorption spectrum are split by the hyperfine coupling. So you can directly read off what the hyperfine coupling between your copper nucleus and the unpaired electron is. And then, of course, you can also still read off the Z and the X and the Y values of, the G, of this G tensor, of these G values, like we've done for nickel, uh, nickel two. Okay, so. What can you learn from this? Well, first of all, whenever you see four lines, you can say it's copper. 
right? And, and many of you have run EPR spectra, will see four lines even without a sample in the EPR spectrometer. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because somebody <laughs> has either the, 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 the resonator is oxidized or corroded or somebody broke a, a copper sample in there. <sighs> okay, so you can learn a lot from this. You can, for example, uh, here's a, a series of spectra from um, the, the old blue copper proteins, that copper two mononuclear complexes, transferrin plus the cyanin, azurine and plus, uh, uh, oh, that's, I think I, I mislabeled that here. What you, what you can see is that the hyperfine splitting changes. And you can also see that the center of this quartet, which is the G value, shifts around. So there's a G value and a hyperfine value you can measure directly. You read off from the spectrum. Now you can uh, use a, a plot. You can plot the G factor on the horizontal axis and the hyperfine splitting on the vertical axis. And you get a so-called Blumberg or Pysoff Blumberg uh, plot. And from this, and then where your protein fits in, you can read off. First of all, what the coordination uh, geometry is. It could be octahedral or planar. You can read off whether it's oxygen ligands or nitrogen ligands or sulfur ligands. See, there's the oxygen ligands are in this area, the nitrogen ligands are in this area, and the sulfur ligands are in this area. And you can also, by going left and right in this here, you can figure out how much of the spin from the copper is actually going onto the ligand. It's kind of, you know, leaking out to the ligands. Okay, so there's actually a ton of information just by looking at the EPR spec and without, you know, solving a spin Hamiltonian uh, by hand. Okay, so you can, uh, same as nickel, you can figure out what is the character of your ground state. You can see the localization onto ligands, the coordination geometry, and the identity of the ligands. So it's pretty powerful, just from a simple CW EPR spectrum. Okay, copper usually doesn't come alone. There is... Uh, well, there are, there are copper clusters that appear in proteins. And I, I want to mention this copper spectrum here, uh, this copper complex here. It's copper acetate. In solution, it actually is a dimer. Well, and it, it, it can be a, um, a fraction of it is a dimer. And if it's a dimer, you have two copper nuclei bridged by four acetates. The two unpaired electrons couple like this, one up, one down. Total spin zero. It's non-magnetic. You won't see it. But there are, there are dinuclear copper complexes in nature. And here's an example of uh, tyrosinase. And of course, now to see a uh, spectrum, you need a mixed valent compound. So copper two has nine electrons, one unpaired electron. Copper one is diamagnetic. So it actually doesn't have an unpaired electron, right? So here you actually see the spin one half from the copper two. And uh, if you look here, again, you see the four features. Um, and you can uh, pull out within the G values, you can find out your dx square, y square uh, ground state. Now, if you add to this tyrosinase state a substrate, anal substrate analog, the spectrum changes a lot, right? It looks like a completely different thing with like structure here that wasn't there before. But basically, what, what changed is that the G values shifted. And that's again an indication of coordination geometry change. So obviously, that substrate analog came closer to copper, or perturbed the copper sphere. It's binding. We have a binding assay, if you want, if you will, right? An EPR binding assay. Another example is copper and nitrous oxide reductase that has a tetra, a tetra copper uh, center in it. And now, if all those four were copper one, there would, everything would be paired, right? Ten electrons on each and nothing. And then you can just, if you pull one electron out, you get to a so-called one whole state that's been one half. If you put the second one out, you get to a two-hole state, which is not EPR visible. And again, if you look at the one-hole spectrum, you see the G values are a little weird. From that, you can read off your delocalize. The hyperfine splitting is fairly small, and you can see more than four lines, which means that the electron is actually delocalized over more than just one copper. And uh, yeah, but and, and you can see from the G values that locally they're each in a sort of dx square minus y square geometry. So it's even for complex systems, it can be a pretty powerful technique to get a first idea of how the center looks like without doing a crystal structure. Can you tweak your instruments to give more definition to those peaks? Um, we would sometimes love that. The, the broadening of these peaks, so this washout, comes from there's a lot of other proto-magnetic nuclei around. So see all the blue things here? These are nitrogens. They broaden the spectrum. There are lots of protons here. So if you could replace all the protons by deuterons, right? And then swap the two copper nuclei that isotoped out to just one, spend some money. 
right? And you would perfectly freeze the sample, so there is no kind of structural variation from one protein to the other. Your peaks would be sharp. You get, you get more definition. Yes, yeah. Hmm? Time, time and money. It's time, it's proportional. Li line sharpness is proportional to dollars and, and, and months, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, so copper is a spin one half, four lines. Remember that. Cobalt, cobalt is, is now, a cobalt two is a paramagnetic system. It can be, as a D7 system, can be either high spin with three unpaired electrons or low spin with just one unpaired electron. And now the great thing about cobalt is, that it has a 100% natural abundant magnetic nucleus that now has eight spin states instead of four for the copper. Now for cobalt, uh, we have cobalt 59 that has eight spin states, which means our total spectrum is now going to be a sum of eight spectra corresponding to each state of the copper nucleus. Okay, and now here's, a, here's an example of just a copper two porphyrin uh, that's used as a model system to, to study the oxygen chemistry with, copper, uh, with cobalt. And you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines. So the hyperfine splitting, the hyperfine coupling is resolved. So you can immediately say this is cobalt, and you can say this is high, uh, this is low spin D7. Okay. Now, if you so this was prepared without oxygen. If you add oxygen, what happens? The G values change, indicative of changes in the coordination sphere. So this is obviously an O2 binding uh, complex. If you look really hard, and that's where you have to pull out your magic EPR glasses, you can see a hyperfine splitting here. <laughs> can you? Yeah, yeah. Good. <clears throat> that's, what, that's what EPR spectroscopists look excited about when they see this. Not when they see like a big peak. All right, so the G-value changes a change of coordination geometry environment. Okay, that was nickel, copper, cobalt. I, I'm indicating the progress up, up here kind of. I mean, Okay, nickel, copper, copper, coal. We're gonna do iron, manganese, some clusters, and some radicals. And then we have lunch. I didn't put that there. It should be an L. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, so I told you the survival kit for EPR, right? Those four books and the software. But here comes a real survival kit. You need a sleeping bag. Because <laughs> spectra can be very weak, especially if you work with uh, proteins or intermediate states. So yeah, you, you have to babysit your spectrometer, make sure it doesn't crash, make sure your temperature stays stable. Sleeping bag is very helpful. Okay, now if you've got your data, you might still be noisy. Now you need a lot of coffee <laughs> to understand what it actually means. Is it background? Is it not? Is it a mixture? Is it not? But there's rescue, right? There's, there's rescue for this. There is like a, 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 new, a new secret Google X project that's developed an EPR edition of Google Glass. <laughs> and if you put that on, it will immediately tell you which features you have. And this lady here, he is one, she's one of the senior EPR uh, engineers at, at Google X. She's, she's happy because finally she's trained the machine learning algorithms to tell her about this spectrum, that this peak is irrelevant and this is a significant peak. <coughs> okay, but unfortunately this, this is not out in the wild yet. So it's only, in, <coughs> and even I don't have access to it. So we need to continue to talk about what's significant and what not in EPR spectra. So let's move on to iron, manganese, and radicals. Um, yeah, it's hard to talk about iron after Iron Man, Carson. So I'll keep that brief. So iron, mononuclear complexes, the two most common oxidation states are iron 3 plus and iron 2 plus. And they're called ferric for 3 plus and ferros for 2. Uh, plus and a the ferric iron can be D5 is a D5 ion has five unpaired electrons if it's a high spin system, but those five can pair up with three and two and just give one unpaired a spin. And then it's called low spin, and the iron two plus has six electrons, and those typically compare in a fashion that you have a spin two a total spin of two, and then that's a little harder to observe with your standard EPR spectrometer that you might have in your basement. Um, Iron 57, 2.2% abundance, Carson told us about that. That's great for two reasons. First of all, it's absent in your normal sample, so you don't get any splittings and, and, and complications. And second of all, you can buy it, or you just walk over to Carson and get some. And you can make a sample with it and start C splittings. Okay, so if you have iron samples, always think about, hmm, would it be useful to make an iron 57 
example, beyond just making one for Carson to uh, measure Mers bar. And it always is. A lot of beautiful work has been done by looking at iron-57 splittings. Iron-57 is a very nice nucleus. It's just two spin states. You get just two lines, a splitting into two lines. OK, here is, uh, I would say, my favorite illustrative examples for a mononuclear iron uh, complex. It's cytochrome P450-CAM. It's a bacterial analog of, uh, of our catabolic library of enzymes in the liver that breaks down stuff we eat and we shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be eating. <laughs> Um, it's an iron-3 resting state, iron-3 plus resting state. Um, it, it's a mixture. It can be a mixture of a low spin and a high spin. So you can see it in the same sample. You can pick up low spin signals and high spin signals. If you look at the low spin G values, 2.45, 2.26, 1.98, uh, those are kind of like a fingerprint that you have a low spin ferric center. Then the high spin has very, very large G values. And here, warning, these G values are not real G values. These are so-called effective G values. They take into account, as Carson said, the, the zero fill splitting, right? If it's high spin, you have five unpaired electrons. And those are all sit on the same iron ion. And they're all magnetic, right? What they're going to do, they, they interact extremely strongly. And that's, that's, that's the origin of the zero fill splitting, or at least one of the origins, the spin-spin coupling. Now, if you change, if you go from with substrate to without substrate, the the high spin vanishes, and you only see a low spin component. We slightly shifted G values, too. And people have actually made sense or actually looked at the structural origin of these slight changes in the G values of, um, between these two forms. OK. By the way, I've included on the, you can go online, the Dropbox, and I've included all the papers where I pulled these things from. So you can just click there. It directly takes you to the paper. All right. And some of these are nice reviews of our, you know, all the copper active sites in biology, like 300-page review. So enjoy <laughs> reading. OK, iron, of course, does not come alone. Iron, there's always a lot of iron in, in, in proteins. There's, there's iron sulfur setters, which is a large class of extremely important uh, enzymes. They come in single iron centers, double irons, so dinuclear, trinuclear centers, and tetranuclear cubane-like iron sulfur clusters. So, and then, of course, for each of them, we will have, depending on the oxidation state, we have a different spin state. And I'm going to sort of pick out one to talk briefly about, which is a two iron, two sulfur cluster. So two iron ions here, two sulfides. And those two other four sulfurs are from cysteinate ligands. All right, this is a two iron, two sulfur cluster. And if you have mixed valence state, iron two plus, iron three plus, it's going to be spin one half in 99% of cases. Okay, so. Remember, iron 3 plus has five unpaired electrons. And iron 2 plus is one electron more, so it's six unpaired electrons. If you couple them antiferromagnetically, five minus six gives you one. So there's only spin one half left, and the EPR gets really simple. Here's an example of these two iron, two sulfur. Uh, here's a ferridoxin that's ligated by four cysteines, like these ones here. If you look at the mixed valence state, iron 2 plus, iron 3 plus, you get three G values. And again, these are fingerprints of the type of center you have. They not only report on the fact that you have a, uh, a mixed valent di di iron center, but it also tells you something about the, the, the coordination geometry. Right? And often with irons, these iron signals, it's really useful to study the literature really carefully. Because as far as I'm aware of, computationally, we can't compute these G values reliably at all yet because of the, the abundance or overabundance of excited states in these systems. Now, if you replace one or two of these cysteine ligands with histidines, the spectrum changes. And you can, again, use this to identify the ligands in your iron sulfur cluster. Um, another very important superfamily of enzymes are these radical SAM enzymes that have a iron sulfur cluster uh, that consists of four irons and four sulfides in it. Um, they have various oxidation states, but the one that's commonly used is, is the one which has a total of spin one half on the, is the reduced one. And we can get an EPR spectrum of that. Here's a zoom in on a cluster that's from work done on pyruvate formid lias activating enzyme, which is one of the uh, enzymes from this, this family. And um, there's a cofactor in this family called um, S-adenosylmethionine. And the first step it is that that cofactor binds to the cluster. And you can see that binding event by taking an, an EPR spectrum without SAM and with SAM. You can see the G values change. Okay, the peaks shift around. And that's, I would say, that the, besides just seeing whether your stuff is pyromagnetic or not, 
that's the second most important thing in bioorganic chemistry, to see if there's a change if you add ligands or cofactors. Then if you can make sense of that change in terms of you know, the spin physics, you know, that often works and sometimes doesn't. All right, now we, now we get to manganese. It gets really complicated. And that's why I put it last. Um, manganese 2 plus is the, the, the most common oxidation state we look at, or we are able to look at from our EPR point of view. Why? Because it has five electrons. So no matter what the ligand field is, you're always going to end up at least with one unpaired electron. Now in all cases I know, um, these five unpaired electrons are parallel. So we have really five unpaired electrons. And we have a high spin situation. We'll have six spin states. Now for the electron, right? Before we had just one unpaired spin, and that can be spin up and spin down. These are two states, spin up, spin down. Now we have six states. And you imagine just a ladder of six levels. And you can go from the first rung to the second rung, from the second rung to the third, from the third to the fourth, fourth or fifth, fifth to sixth. That makes a total of five different um, electron transitions. So that's complicated. Uh, and those five electrons, of course, they sit on the same ion, so they're like within picometers of each other and really strongly interact. So we will see huge effects on these magnetic interactions and spin orbit coupling. Now the second complication is that manganese has a 100% magnetic, uh, mag uh, magnetic isotope, manganese 55. And that's not just a spin one half, it's a spin five half. It also has six spin states. You have six electron spin states and six nuclear spin states. So six times six is 36. And so that's where we're looking. We're looking at transitions between these 36 levels here. But let's break it down. So you're measuring this spectrum here. And the first signature thing you can see, and again, you might see that in your spectrometer, even without a sample, is you see six lines that are equally spaced. This is due to the coupling, hyperfine coupling to manganese. Okay, because manganese has six spin states, the nucleus. So a six of your proteins will have the manganese in the and the minus five half state, and so on and so forth. Right? Groups of uh, 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 six groups of, of uh, or six, six subgroups. All right. So the six, the six features. Okay. Manganese. Go integrate. If you integrate, you get to this shape here, and you see there's a really broad background there. And then you have these little humps in between. The really broad background is from transitions that don't involve that are so-called non-central transitions. If you have six unpaired electrons of five unpaired electrons, right? You have these six states, six ladder states. And the bottom state is when all those electrons moments are such that they add up and point down, okay? And then you would have a transition that's gonna be extremely broad. You see they're extremely washed out here. See the first green line here. That's a tr transition from the negative five half to the negative three half electron spin state, okay? And then for, for the other five, you have that too. The simplest one is the blue one. That's called the central transition. That's where you have this level three to level four. That's essentially where, where these five spins combine in such a way that it's like a spin half, plus minus one half transition, okay? And that gives rise to those six sharp features. The wings here, the broad wings, which you even don't barely see here, there's a lot of absorption here. You don't see that in the derivative because it's really broad. Those are from these non-central transitions because it's a high spin system, spin five halves. And then come the red ones. These are so-called forbidden transitions. Right? We call them forbidden, but obviously they're not. Right? Um, they are partially allowed. And these are spin flips of not just the electron, but an uh, accompanying spin flip of the manganese nucleus. They go like this. Right? Or like this. Okay? Um, we were only sh shining light on the, on the electron transition. And we here happen to have, due to the strong interaction between those two spins, we also have these forbidden transitions where the nucleus flips as well. Okay, so manganese, it looks terribly complicated, but then if you go to a simple manganese spectrum, often just looking at it will tell you a lot. Um, here on top you see a different comparison of uh, coordination geometries. The top concanabal in A, octahedral coordination environment, six lines, very boring. Even those forbidden, forbidden features are not there. They're suppressed. If you change the, uh, if you decrease the symmetry, you go to a low symmetry uh, six coordinate, it starts looking funny. And that's because the spin-spin interactions, the zero field splitting gets complicated, and that just broadens out the lines. But you still, you see six features, manganese. Right? Um, 
Now you go to um, an enzyme like uh, manganese superoxide dismutase, which has a trigonal bipyramidal five coordinate, manganese two center in one of the states, and the zero field splitting is very strong and it gets, it gets very complicated. But you see there are one, two, three, four, five, six. They kind of all go up. If you count from this side, one, two, three, four, five, six. You see that, these three little bumps here? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six sharp peaks and one, two, three, four, five, six. Six broad peaks. Still manganese, but they're obviously the X and the Z directions and the Y directions, they're now resonating at different fields. We're seeing more anisotropy in this system because it's so much low symmetry. But it can get really boring. Um, this is another enzyme oxalate decarboxylase. If, X, if you run this in your spectrometer, your spectrum will look like this. Broad, featureless, tons of little wiggles. But then you, what you can do, you can go to high field. Higher frequency, higher field, and it simplifies your spectra. Okay, so high field DPR is not only good for measuring integer spin systems, like your nickel-2 system, for example, but it's also good for simplifying manganese spectra. All right, you can oxidize manganese three, uh, 2 to manganese 3, and you get a spin-2 system. High spin, integer spin, Carson told you you can't see it. Here are the spectra. <laughs> but there's a trick. Of course, we're not using standard perpendicular mode EPR, we're using parallel mode EPR, where the, the, static magnetic, uh, the microwave magnetic field is now parallel to the static magnetic field. We're not just flipping the spin and doing a delta M sub S of plus minus one, we actually can connect transitions where the delta M is, is zero, it doesn't change at all. And that allows you to see features like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, manganese, okay, in parallel mode EPR, and you can simulate them. You can even see a uh, you see them in single crystals, if you, ha if you have the luck to make a single crystal. I guess with myoglobin, it works. Okay, but even for more complicated uh, systems, here's manganese uh, superoxide dismutase, a, a, a now in a manganese three oxidation state. And you look at the parallel mode, EPR, you can see, depending on whether you have a score rate um, put in there or not, you get either six peaks, indicated by blue, or you get 12 peaks, that's the middle one. And there's, there's another system from another organism that only has six peaks that correspond to the red. So what you can pull out here for, for manganese 3 plus SOD, you see it's a mixture of two different coordination geometries. Well, now you need to go figure out what's the microscopic origin of that. But at least you have a spectral signature that we have a mixture of, of two different things going on there. You can change your pH, change your gas loading, you know, do things and make mutants and figure out how these spectra changes. Um, you can, from the size of the splitting, you see here it's large, the blue splitting is large, but the red splitting is small. You can learn about, for manganese 3 plus, where the empty orbital is. So dz squared plus a dx squared minus y squared. So again, you get, just without even simulating it, fingerprinting, you learn uh, where your unpaired electrons are. And it gets more complicated. <laughs> okay, manganese 2 clusters. You can get mixed valence states and you have now six nuclear states on one manganese and another six on the other. Six times six is 36. So each electron line splits in 36 hyperfine lines. But remember, we have six, five electron transitions. You get five times 36, 180 absorptions. It gets unwieldy, right? But you can, you can draw pictures, publish pictures like this. And they're very instructive, actually. Uh, okay, and this is probably the most complicated uh, this, this is the one metal cluster with the most absorption lines. So unfortunately, not all resolved. This is the tetramanganese uh, oxygen evolving complex from photosystem 2. And you can put it in a certain state where you can see a lot of hyperfine lines. Manganese. This actually is something I measured in the lab. This is called the multi-line signal. All right. But it gets too complicated. Just, um, of course, uh, I need to wrap up, right? Uh, of course, they're not just metals in proteins that are paramagnetic. They can also be radicals. Now we're proved, moving to carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And those, I typically group them into three, uh, into three categories. They're protein-based radicals, most prominently tyrosyl, but also tryptophanol, cysteine, and glycyl radicals. They're cofactor radicals, which include semiquinones, flavins, and the very famous 5 prime deoxyadenosyl radical. And then there are substrate radicals. There are many of them because there are many substrates, and there are many enzymes that work on these substrates in an uh, um, anaerobic you know, single electron transfer, hydrogen atom transfer fashion. Most of these, or actually all of these radicals, are spin one half, but they sit on an organic molecule. And there's a lot of protons. So you have a lot of splittings and, uh, due to hyperfine couplings. 
The G tensors are very small. You don't get 2.5 for G value. You get 2.008 if, if it's large. And uh, you can resolve that again with high field EPR. And then you can identify the radicals um, from this class. All right. Then you get mixed element clusters, manganese iron, or here iron and a radical. Right? You can couple those metal and organic radicals together. And then you have to just do your spin state analysis and figure out what you have. But look here, this is a manganese iron uh, cluster. Actually, the work is done here. Manganese and iron are very close. How many lines do you see here? Six, right? So there is some spin on manganese. How many lines do you see here? Hmm. You have to be a little more trained. But you can see like one kind of powder spectrum here, a second one here, a third one here. It's very isotropic. A fourth one here, another powder spectrum, a, a sixth powder spectrum. Manganese. Okay? So you can identify what you have in your site. All right. Yeah, then let's go over this and let's just summarize to get full on. So paramagnetic species in biomagnetic systems. Those are the magic five. Manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper. There's also a bit of molybdenum, and some clusters have vanadium or tungsten in them. And the other big group is of radicals that are carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur-based. Nature has mixed and matched all these centers to achieve all the functionality that we have in life. Um, the CWPR workflow works like this. You, you work hard to get an EPR spectrum, and then you work even harder to extract the EPR parameters, the spin, the G-tensor, the zero-field splitting, and the hyperfine interactions, and then you work as hard as you can, and if you're lucky, you can actually infer something of the structure. <laughs> um, so that brings me to the, well, the key concept, I hope for the novices in, this, in, in the audience here, you take away only two things. Forget about all the details of a manganese versus copper. Derivative versus absorption is important. Okay? And the second thing is important to be aware of what is the powder spectrum and that like different orientations of molecules give resonance at different positions. And in the powder spectrum, we have all of them together at the same time. So, okay, here's the lunch slide. Ten things you can discuss. The ten things you can learn from CWPR. Okay? First of all, you can get the spin concentrations, typically in micromolar. And it might be zero micromolar if you get a flat line, which means there is no, you can identify is there a radical there or not. Number two, when you see a signal, you can identify what center it is. Is that copper? Is it iron sulfur cluster? Is it a radical? Right? Um, then you also, in, in, in combination with that, you can, you can figure out what the, what the oxidation state is. Is it, is it one plus, two plus, three plus, four plus, and so on? And you get also a hold of the spin state high spin or low spin, which, which often has very, very important implications for reactivity because there's a lot of chemistry that's spin forbidden. And then if you have the right spin states, it becomes spin allowed and it runs much faster. So spin states are not just a, uh, you know, the favorite thing for spectroscopists, but they're also important for chemistry and reactivity. Then you can figure out what is the nature of these half-occupied orbitals we're looking at. Is it dz squared or dxy or dx squared minus y squared? You can learn about the coordination geometry. Is it octahedral? Is it trigonal, monopyramidal? Is it distorted tetragonal? And so on and so forth. You can figure out our, lig our ligands binding or not. Right? It's kind of related to the coordination geometry. Or you add a ligand, does it bind to the center? You look for changes. You can learn about the nature of the ligand. An oxygenic ligand, a nit nitrogen ligand, or even a sulfur ligand. You can learn about, again, this goes in parallel, about spin delocalization onto ligands. Oxygen does not take on a lot of spin if it coordinates to metals, but sulfur does, right? So you can learn about that and quantify that even. And last but not least, you can determine whether in a cluster the valence is localized or delocalized. These are, I think, ten important things uh, to just keep in mind if you, you work in your system and, and think maybe EPR can actually, and you have this question, maybe EPR can provide you the answer. And with this, let's go off to lunch. Thank you very much. I'm not sure whether I m mentioned that before. So during the poster session, the odd poster numbers will be at their posters during the first hour and the ones with an even number during the second hour. And we'll do the same thing on Wednesday again, okay? See you then. <laughs>